Madam President, I thank my colleague, the Senator from Rhode Island, and I join him in opposition, in strong opposition to the nomination of Mr. Stephen Bradbury to, the, to be the General Counsel at the U.S. Department of Transportation. Mr. Bradbury is a deeply flawed nominee for many reasons, including his unwillingness to recuse himself from issues involving his former clients and dodging commitments to forego accepting waivers for recusals. However, my opposition to his nomination is rooted in his troubling record while serving at the Department of Justice during the Bush administration. Madam President, as you know, Mr. Bradbury was Acting Assistant Sec Attorney General at the Department of Justice from 2005 to 2007 and led the Office of Legal Counsel there from 2005 to 2009. When he was nominated by President George W. Bush to be Assistant Sec Attorney General in 2004, his nomination was so unacceptable that the majority leader at the time offered to confirm 84 stalled nominees, 84, in exchange for the withdrawal of his nomination. Let me repeat that. The Senate majority leader at the time was willing to accept 84 other nominees in exchange for President Bush withdrawing Mr. Bradbury's nomination. What senators objected to then and the reason I am so strongly opposed to Mr. Bradbury's nomination now is that Mr. Bradbury is a chief architect of the legal justification that authorized waterboarding and other forms of enhanced interrogation techniques that we used to hear a lot, that we used to hear a lot about during the last Bush presidency. For those who might not be familiar with the term enhanced inter interrogation, there's another term for it that most Americans probably are familiar with. It's called torture. The torture memos, as they're commonly referred to today, represent a dark period in our nation's recent history that we must never repeat. In my opinion, his connection to these memos alone should disqualify Mr. Bradbury from government service. I understand that he's nominated to serve at the Department of Transportation and not the Department of Justice, but his very willingness in the past to aid and abet torture demonstrates a failure of moral character that makes him dangerous to the American people, to our troops, regardless of which agency he is nominated to serve in. Those torture memos displayed a disturbing disregard for the intent of Congress and flouted both international and United States law. If confirmed, Mr. Bradbury will swear a solemn oath to serve the interests of the American public by providing honest and objective legal analysis to the department and the administration. I doubt, that he can, I doubt that he can carry out that oath. The American government would once again rely on his counsel to make sure that Department of Transportation employees do not subvert the law, the intent of Congress, or the United States Constitution. Unfortunately, he's let both the government and the American people down before and I have no confidence that he is capable of carrying out this critically important role. Public servants are supposed to serve the public interest, not the political whims of any president, Democrat or Republican. The public should be alarmed by Mr. Bradbury's history of demonstrating complete deference to a president's policy goals, and we in the Senate should do everything we can to prevent likelihood of that history continuing in the Trump administration. For my colleagues who may not be familiar with the programs Mr. Bradbury justified in his legal opinion, let me clarify. Detainees, under his opinion, could be sleep deprived for up to 180 hours, approximately seven and a half days, forced into stress positions. Sometimes they were shackled to the ceiling, subjected to rectal rehydration and feeding, confined in boxes the size of small dog crates. It was also Mr. Bradbury's legal opinion that led, that led CIA personnel to conduct mock executions. His legal opinion led to one man being waterboarded to the point that he became, and I'm quoting here, completely unresponsive with bubbles rising through his open full mouth, end of quote. His legal opinion also led to another man being frozen to death. Some of these abuses were authorized, others were not. 
But brutality, once sanctioned, is not easily contained. In 2005, this body voted 90 to 9 to enact the Detainee Treatment Act to prohibit cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. That law was enacted after the Supreme Court decided that terrorism detainees in U.S. custody were protected by the Geneva Conventions. However, Mr. Bradbury still found legal loopholes to allow torture to continue. Even the Department of Justice's own Office of Professional Responsibility criticized him for, quote, uncritical acceptance of the CIA's representations about the torture program. This is stunning, and it cannot simply be dismissed. In testimony before the Senate Judiciary Committee in 2007, Mr. Bradbury defended the President's questionable interpretation of the Hamdan case, a case where the Supreme Court ruled that President Bush did not have the authority to set up military tribunals at Guantanamo by famously suggesting the President is always right. This rubber stamp mentality is extremely dangerous, especially in the Trump administration. What will Mr. Bradbury do if President Trump asks him to come up with a legal justification to abolish laws mandating seatbelt use or to come up with ways to negate drunk driving laws? Let me be clear. Mr. Bradbury didn't make America safer, and he certainly didn't make our men and women in uniform safer either. Quite the opposite. The actions Mr. Bradbury helped to justify put our troops and diplomats deployed overseas in greater danger. This is personal to me because perhaps most disturbingly, Mr. Bradbury, Mr. Bradbury's efforts to enable torture compromise our nation's values. Our nation's military men and women are taught the laws of armed conflict, the proper way to care for detainees, the importance of acting in accordance with American values. Mr. Bradbury's actions at the Department of Justice undermined those values. This type of twisted legal wrangling done at, the, at a desk far from the field of battle puts larger targets on the back of our troops. If captured, are they now at greater risk of being tortured themselves? How we treat prisoners under our control affects how our troops are treated. Let me read to you Warren Officer Michael Durante's account of what happened to him when he was shot down and captured in Mogadishu, Somalia. This is from his book, and I quote, Durant's fear of being executed or tortured eased after several days in, a, in captivity. After being at the center of that enraged mob on the day that he crashed, he mostly feared being discovered by the Somalian public. It was a, share, a fear shared by Farimbi, who was uh, one, of his, one of the people guarding him. The propaganda minister had clearly grown fond of him. It was something Durant worked at, part of his survival training. The two men were together day and night for a week. Farimbi spoke Italian and Durante spoke some Spanish, languages similar enough for them to minimally communicate. Farimbi considered Durant a prisoner of war, and he believed that by treating the pilot humanely, he would improve the image of Somalis in America upon his release. Mr. Durant talked at length about how he was treated when he was captured in Somalia. He talked about going for days without his wounds being cared for, being dragged out of his downed Black Hawk by a mob. He talked about being beaten. He talked about someone sticking a rifle into his room and firing and shooting him where he had to pull the round out of his own shoulder. He talked about being shackled. But all of that is still better than the treatment that Mr. Bradbury's justifications allow to happen now. It makes our troops' jobs harder and more dangerous, and their job is already pretty dangerous. Take it from me, our troops will do any job we ask of them, but we shouldn't be trying to make those jobs more difficult or dangerous than they already are. I can tell you from firsthand experience, as someone who has bled behind enemy lines, legal gymnastics are a luxury not afforded the men and women, our men and women in the field. They are at battle, 
And more importantly, these justifications does not protect our troops who are sitting on the floor of a POW cell. When you're stuck bleeding in a helicopter behind enemy lines, you hope and pray that the enemy finds you first. If they find you first, they treat you humanely. When I was in flight school, I began the first of several periods when I was trained in the art of survival, escape, evasion, and rescue. All pilots received this training, and then when we were deployed to Iraq, we also, as members of the United States troops overseas, who were identified as most likely at risk of being captured among U.S. troops deployed there, received additional training. This is what the Army told me I could expect upon being captured. I could expect to be raped. I could expect to be beaten. I could expect to be starved. As I sat in my helicopter, thanking God that there was another aircraft there to pull me out, even as the enemy were jumping into their pickup trucks, speeding towards us to try to capture us, the very realities of what Mr. Bradbury was justifying happened to me. It is not something that you can look at from the safety and security of a desk in Washington. Our troops face this every single day. This is why this nomination is so incredibly, incredibly troubling. If the warlords in Somalia recognized the Geneva Convention and treated Chief Warrant Officer Durant's capture more humanely, what does that say about Mr. Bradbury and his willingness to allow far greater forms of torture than what the Somali warlords were willing to go, were willing to do? Mr. Bradbury lacked the moral conviction in the Bush at White House that Somali warlords possess in Mogadishu. And I don't think he can be trusted to stand up for the values I fought to defend, especially not the current administration. You don't just need to take my word for it, Mr. President. Mr. Bradbury's record speaks for itself. But in case, but in case this point isn't clear enough, here's what retired Marine Corps General Charles Krulak wrote to the Commerce Committee about this nominee just this year on June 26 of 2017, and I quote, in his role as acting head of the Department of Justice's Office of Legal Counsel, Mr. Bradbury displayed a disregard for both U.S. and international law when authorizing the use of so-called enhanced interrogation techniques to interrogate terrorism suspects. The general goes on further to say, these interrogation techniques, which Mr. Bradbury repeatedly approved, included methods that the United States has acknowledged and even prosecuted as torture and cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. The use of these techniques not only violated well-established law and military doctrine, but also endangered U.S. troops and personnel, hindered the war effort, and betrayed the country's values, damaging the United States' stature around the world as a beacon for human rights and the rule of law. We know that the United States is strongest when it remains faithful to its core values. The use of torture and cruel, inhuman, degrading treatment undermines those values and Mr. Bradbury's continually represented their use as legal and advisable during his time serving in the Bush administration. The general goes on to say further, in recommending these techniques, Mr. Bradbury also displayed a discomforting deference to the executive branch's wish, tailoring his legal recommendations to fit the White House's preferred outcome and even testified in a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing that the president is always right. Mr. Bradbury's recommendations also contradicted the intent of Congress. In 2005, Congress passed the Detainee Treatment Act with a vote of 90 to 9. The law prohibited abuse of detainees by the U.S. military and agencies, but Mr. Bradbury authored a legal memo specifically designed to undermine the will of Congress and to provide the Bush administration with authorization to continue using interrogation methods that constitute torture and cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. I believe that this is more important than political affiliation. Mr. Bradbury has time and again shown his willingness to contravene established law and the intent of Congress in service to the will of the executive branch.
Though the position to which he's nominated likely will not involve decisions on national security issues, I believe that based on his past governmental service, Mr. Bradbury is not fit for this political office. I ask you respectfully to oppose his nomination, end quote. And that letter is signed, Semper Fidelis, Charles C. Krulak, General, USMC retired, 31st Commandant of the Marine Corps. Also opposing Mr. Bradbury's nomination are 14, 14 former national security, law enforcement, intelligence, and interrogation prof professionals whose experience includes service in the US military, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Central Intelligence Agency, the Drug Enforcement Administration, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the Army Criminal Investigation Command, and the Naval Criminal Investigative Service. And they wrote, and I'm quoting again, we write today to express our opposition to the nomination of Mr. Stephen Bradbury to serve once again in a position of significant responsibility within the US government as general counsel of the Department of Transportation. Our opposition stems from the necessary judgment and personal courage this office requires to provide candid and objective legal advice to policymakers that may be seeking politically expedient policy solutions. We dedicate our professional lives to keeping our nation safe. That work demanded using every resource at our disposal, including and especially our moral authority. Our enemies act without conscience, but we must not. Mr. Bradbury spent many years serving in the Department of Justice, including as acting head of the Office of Legal Counsel during the George W. Bush administration. In this position, he prepared official memoranda that provided legal cover for other agencies in the US government to employ a program of interrogation tactics that amounted to torture or cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment. These brutal methods, which include waterboarding, fundamentally violated domestic and international law, governing detainee treatment, and caused untold strategic and operational harm to our national security. As former interrogators, intelligence, and law enforcement professionals with extensive firsthand experience in the field of interrogation, we were shocked by Mr. Bradbury's attempt to defend the use of waterboard and other torture tactics based on the incorrect assertions that their use would not cause severe physical pain or suffering and would produce valuable intelligence. In our professional judgment, torture and other forms of detainee abuse are not only immoral and unlawful, they are ineffective and counterproductive in gathering reliable intelligence. They also tarnish America's global standing, undermine critical alliances, and bolster our enemy's propaganda efforts. If the Senate confirms Mr. Bradbury, it would send a clear message to the American public that authorizing the use of torture is not only acceptable, but is not a barrier to advancement into the upper ranks of our government. We understand that Mr. Bradbury did not act alone in authorizing torture, but as his nomination is before you, we ask you to take this opportunity to reaffirm our commitment to the ideals we strive to uphold by rejecting his nomination. Torture is not a partisan issue. Our respect for human, human dignity is timeless, and we must never risk our national honor to prevail in any war. Your vote to reject this nomination would reflect the, moral, the morally sound leadership that this country needs and would for, not forget." End quote. And in another letter, dated July 27 of this year, 2017, to the Commerce Committee, retired U.S. Air Force Colonel Stephen Kleiman wrote, and I quote, I write to express my deep concerns about confirming Mr. Bradbury to serve once again in a position of significant trust and responsibility within the U.S. government. I do not for a moment question his legal credentials. Rather, my apprehension centers around the equally important elements of judgment and personal courage necessary to provide legal advice that might run counter to the positions advocated by his superiors. History records that we have been down, history records that we have been down this road once before with, with Mr. Bradbury, and he was found sadly wanting. As I trust you are aware, Mr. Bradbury served in senior positions within the Department of Justice, including as acting head of the Office of Legal Counsel during the George W. Bush administration. In that capacity, he prepared official memoranda that provided legal 
cover for other agencies of the U.S. government to implement a program of severely coercive interrogation practices. These practices included an array of tactics to include war waterboarding that fundamentally violated domestic and international law prohibiting cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. As an officer with extensive experience in both strategic interrogation and in training members of the U.S. Armed Forces to resist hostile interrogation, I was taken aback by Mr. Bradbury's attempt to defend the use of the waterboard based on wholly unfounded conjecture that it would not cause severe physical pain or suffering. If the Senate committee were to favorably report this nomination to the full Senate, it would be sending a clear and undeniable message to the world, and more importantly, to the American public, that definitive action to support the institution use, institutional use of torture is acceptable. Clearly, Mr. Bradbury acted in, cons in concert with an untold number of others within our government, and I am not asking that he be singled out for his actions. But at this time, his nomination is the one before you, and with it, an opportunity for the committee members to act on behalf of all Americans in taking a vital step towards reclaiming the moral high ground. From the, from the perspective of this American, the debate over torture is not one that can be subject to partisan debate. Instead, torture is something that is so inherently wrong and so contrary to this nation's traditional values that it can be one issue around which the entire country and the United States Senate can rally. Your vote to unfavorably report this nomination to your colleagues would be much needed demonstration of ethical leadership that would not soon be forgotten. And it is signed, very respectfully, Stephen M. Kleiman, Colonel, U.S. Air Force, retired. Former Navy General Counsel Alberto Mora has written also, and I quote, while acting as the head of the Office of Legal Counsel, Stephen Bradbury proved himself to be an advocate for the brutal treatment of detainees. And then, when the Congress enacted the McCain Amendment to strengthen the legal prohibitions against cruelty, he counseled the administration on legal strategies on how to circumvent the law and the Congress's will. In exercising its advice and consent, and consent duty with respect to the nominations of senior counsel to serve in this or any administration, the Senate should take care to confirm only those individuals with a clear record of respect for the law and for the power of Congress as a coordinate and equal branch of government. Stephen Bradbury's record, unfortunately, demonstrates a disrespect for both." End quote. In a June 22, 2017 letter to the Commerce Committee, 14 human rights organizations highlighted their opposition to Mr. Bradbury's nomination. And I quote, we write to express our serious concerns regarding the nomination of Stephen G. Bradbury for General Counsel of the Department of Transportation Mr. Bradbury's role in justifying torture and cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment of individuals held in U.S. custody marked him as an architect of the torture program. Not only should the Senate be concerned about confirming a nominee who had a central role in the criminal violation of human rights, but his work during that period caused into question his ability to provide the kind of rigorous, independent legal analysis that is required of any top government lawyer. Mr. Bradbury was acting head of the Department of Justice's Office of Legal Counsel from 2005 to 2009. During that time, Mr. Bradbury wrote several legal memoranda that authorized waterboarding and other forms of torture and cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment. As such, he is most prominently and correctly known as one of the authors of the torture memos. His analysis directly contradicted relevant domestic and international law regarding the treatment of prisoners and helped establish an official policy of torture and detainee abuse that has caused incalculable damage to both the United States and the prisoners it held. Mr. Bradbury's role in the torture program even then was notorious, so much so that the Senate refused to confirm him as Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Counsel during the Bush administration. The Senate now knows even more about Mr. Bradbury's record and the harm caused by his opinions based on oversight by the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence and its report on the Central Intelligence Agency's use of torture and abuse. 
In Mr. Bradbury's time as acting head of the OLC, he demonstrated an unwavering willingness to defer to the authority and wishes of the president and his team instead of providing objective and independent counsel. During congressional testimony in 2007, Mr. Bradbury responded to questions about the president's interpretation of the law by declaring, the president is always right, a statement that is as outrageous as it is inaccurate. The objectivity and reasonableness of Mr. Bradbury's analysis. The, the uh, DOJ Office of Professional Responsibility reviewed Mr. Bradbury's torture memos and determined that they raised questions about the objectivity and reasonableness of Mr. Bradbury's analysis, that Mr. Bradbury relied on uncritical acceptance of executive branch assertions, and that in some cases, Mr. Bradbury's legal conclusions were inconsistent with the plain meaning and commonly held understanding of the law. Senior government officials from the Bush administration who worked with Mr. Bradbury have said that they had grave reservations about conclusions drawn in the Bradbury torture memos and have described Mr. Bradbury's analysis as flawed, saying the memos could be considered a work of an advocacy to achieve a desired outcome. Moreover, Mr. Bradbury's 2007 memo, torture memo was written with the purpose of evading congressional intent and duly enacted federal law. The Detainee Treatment Act of 2005 Legislation that passed the Senate with a vote of 90 to 9 stated, no individual in the custody or under the physical control of the United States government, regardless of nationality or physical location, shall be subject to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment. However, Mr. Bradbury's memo explicitly allowed the continuation of many of the abusive interrogation techniques that Congress intended to prohibit in the DTA. Perhaps most concerning from a congressional oversight perspective, Mr. Bradbury's affirmative misrep affirmatively misrepresented the views of members of Congress to support his legal conclusions. Specifically, in his 2007 memo, he relied on a false claim that when the CIA briefed the full memberships of the House and Senate Intelligence Committees and Senator McCain, none of the members expressed a view that the CIA detention and interrogation program should be stopped or that the techniques at issue were inappropriate. In fact, Senator McCain had characterized the CIA's practice of sleep deprivation as torture, both publicly and privately, and at least four other senators raised objections to the program. As a senior government lawyer, Mr. Bradbury authorized torture and cruel treatment of detainees in violation of US and international law. Mr. Bradbury demonstrated either an inability or an unwillingness to display objectivity and reasonableness in evaluating the president's policy proposals. We ask that in reviewing Mr. Bradbury's nomination for general counsel of the Department of Transportation, another profoundly important position of public trust, you take these serious and disturbing factors into consideration." End quote. That letter was signed by the American Civil Liberties Union, Appeal for Justice, Center for Constitutional Rights, Center for Victims of Torture, the Constitution Project, the Council on American Islamic Relations, Defending Rights and Dissent, Human Rights First, Human Rights Watch, the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, the National Religious Campaign Against Torture, the Open Society Pol Policy Center, Physicians for Human Rights, and Win Without War. Earlier this year, a group of 176 of the most respected retired generals and admirals wrote to then President-elect Trump urging him to reject the very kinds of torture and cruel treatment Mr. Bradbury authorized. They wrote, and I quote, we have over 6,000 years of combined experience in commanding and leading American men and women in war and in peace and believe strongly in the values and ideals that our country holds dear. We know from experience that U.S. national security policies are most effective when they uphold these ideals. For these reasons, we are concerned about statements made during the campaign about the use of torture or cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment of detainees in U.S. custody. The use of waterboarding or any so-called enhanced interrogation techniques is unlawful under domestic and international law. Opposition to torture has been strong 
and bipartisan since the founding of our republic through the administration of President Ronald Reagan to this very day. This was reinforced last year when the Congress passed a McCain-Feinstein anti-torture law on an overwhelmingly bipartisan basis. Torture is unnecessary. Based on our experience and that of our nation's top interrogators, backed by the latest science, we know that lawful rapport-based interrogation techniques are the most effective way to elicit actionable intelligence. Torture is also counterproductive because it undermines our national security. It increases the risk to our troops, hinders cooperations with allies, alienates populations who support the United States' needs in the struggle against terrorism, and provides a propaganda tool for extremists who wish to do us harm. Most importantly, torture violates our core values as a nation. Our greatest strength is our commitment to the rule of law and to the principles embedded in our Constitution. Our servicemen and women need to know that our leaders do not condone torture or detainee abuse of any kind." End quote. Now, I know some people might not understand why these enhanced interrogation techniques are a problem. So let me just take a few moments to explain why they are, explain what they are. Waterboarding. Waterboarding is a well-known torture tactic. Waterboarding creates the sensation of asphyxiation or drowning. The detainee is immobilized on his back and water is poured over a cloth covering his face. Far from the dunk in the water that Dick Cheney has referred to, internal CIA reports instances of waterboarding as near drownings. Detainees were often waterboarded repeatedly. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was waterboarded at least 183 times. Another detainee, Abu Zubaria, was waterboarded so often that it led him to at least once to become completely unresponsive with bubbles rising through his mouth. This torture tactic may also lead to bleeding from the ears, severe lung and brain damage, and lasting psychological damage. If we, board, if we waterboard our prisoners, they will waterboard our men and women when they become prisoners. Walling. Walling is a torture technique that involves encircling the detainee's neck with a collar or a towel and slamming him against a wall. Despite a requirement to use false wall to avoid injury, Abu Zubaydah was initially slammed against a concrete wall. Even in the event of a false wall was used, detainees suffered extreme injury. Abu Jafar al-Iraqi, suffered from an edema or swelling on his head as a consequence of walling with the use of a false wall. If we use this technique on our prisoners, they will use this technique on our men and women in uniform if they were to capture them. Sleep deprivation. The detainees were kept awake by being shackled, forced to stand, or kept in stress positions in an attempt to destroy their capacity for psychological resistance. This was routinely combined with nudity and or around the clock interrogation. Though not overtly violent, extended periods of sleep deprivation can have painful and damaging mental and physical effects. After being forced to stand for 54 hours, Abu Jafar al-Iraqi required blood thinners to treat the swelling in his legs. Following 56 hours without sleep, Arsala Khan suffered from violent hallucinations of dogs mauling and killing his family. If we, the United States of America, use this technique on our prisoners, our enemies will use this technique on our men and women in uniform should they be captured. Standing on broken feet. An extreme form of sleep deprivation, two detainees, Abu Hazim and Abd al-Karim, were forced to stand for hours with broken feet. Despite recommendations that he avoid weight-bearing for three months, Abu Hazim went, underwent 52 hours of standing sleep deprivation on his broken foot, barely a month after his diagnosis. While injured, these detainees were also subject to walling. Again, when we do this to our prisoners, our enemies will do this to our troops. Solitary confinement. Detainees are regularly confined with no opportunity to social interaction. This was often combined with nudity, sensory deprivation, total darkness or constant light, and shackling. Abu Zubaydah was isolated naked in a cell with bright lights and white noise or loud music playing. At one point, he was kept for 47 days in total isolation. The dangers of solitary confinement were recognized by the United States Supreme Court as early as 
1890 in Re Medley, where the court described prisoners becoming violently insane, committing suicide, and the partial loss of their mental activity. If we do this to our prisoners, they will do it to our troops. Stress positions. These positions are designed to cause pain and discomfort for extended periods of time and were often used in combination with sleep deprivation. Detainees were shackled with their arms over their heads, forced to stay standing, and or, or were placed in cramped confinement such as coffin-sized boxes. Abd al-Rahim al-Nashiri was subjected to improvised stress positions that not only caused cuts and bruises, but led to the intervention of a medical officer who was concerned that his shoulders would be dislocated. Abu Zubaydah was confined to a coffin-shaped box for a total of over 11 days. We do this to our prisoners, and Mr. Bradbury justified this. They will do it to our troops. Rectal feeding and rectal exams. Rectal feeding was used for prisoners who refused food and entails the insertion of a tube containing pureed food into the detainee's anal passage. This was used for behavior control without medical necessity, despite risk of damage to the colon and rectum, or of food rotting inside the digestive tract. One detainee, Mustafa Ahmed al Hasawi, suffered a rectal prolapse likely caused by overly harsh rectal exams. We do this to our prisoners. And Mr. Bradbury's memo made it so that we could. They will do this to our troops should our troops be captured by the enemy. Nudity. This form of sexual humiliation relies on cultural and religious taboos and required detainees to be fully or partially naked during interrogations or when shackled. Nudity was also regularly combined with cold temperatures and cold showers. One detainee, Go Rahman, died of suspected hypothermia following 48 hours of sleep deprivation, half naked in an extremely cold room. Again, when we do this to our prisoners, and Mr. Bradbury wrote the legal justification allowing this to happen, they will do this to our troops. We do not want this man in the United States government making more decisions about what is right and what is wrong and how to protect the American public. He was willing to do this and allow this to happen. What can we trust him to have good judgment on? In a September 6, 2006 article by Sean Alfano at CBS AP entitled, U.S. Army Bans Torture of Prisoners, he wrote, a new U.S. Army manual bans torture and degrading treatment of prisoners for the first time specifically mentioning forced nakedness, hooding, and other procedures that have become infamous since the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks. Delayed more than a year amid criticism of the Defense Department's treatment of prisoners, the new Army Field Manual was released Wednesday, revising a previous one from 1992. It also explicitly bans beating prisoners, sexually humiliating them, threatening them with dogs, depriving them of food or water, performing mock executions, shocking them with electricity, burning them, causing other pain, and a technique called waterboarding that simulates drowning, said Lieutenant General John Kimmons, Army Deputy Chief of Staff for Intelligence. Officials said the revisions are based on lessons learned since the U.S. began taking prisoners in response to the September 11, 2001 attacks on the United States. Release of the manual came amid a flurry of announcements about the U.S. handling of prisoners, which has drawn criticism from Bush administration critics as well as domestic and international allies. The Pentagon also announced an overall policy statement on prisoner operations. And President George W. Bush acknowledged the existence of previously secret CIA prisons around the world where terrorist suspects have been held and interrogated, saying 14 such al-Qaeda leaders had been transferred to the military prison at Guantanamo Bay and will be brought to trial. An international outcry about prisoner rights began shortly afterward. Human rights groups in some nations have urged the Bush administration to close the prisons at the U.S. naval base in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, since not long after it opened in 2002, with prisoners from the campaign against al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. Scrutiny of U.S. treatment of prisoners shot to a new level in 2004, with the release of photos showing U.S. troops beating, intimidating, and sexually abusing prisoners at Abu Ghraib in Iraq, and then again with news of secret facilities. Through defense officials earlier this year debated 
writing, though defense officials earlier this year debated writing a classified section of the manual to keep some interrogation procedures a secret from potential enemies, Kimmon said Wednesday that there is no secret section to the new manual. Defense Secretary Donald H. Rumsfeld has said from the start of the counterterror war that prisoners were treated humanely and in a manner consistent with the Geneva Conventions. But President George W. Bush decided shortly after September 11 attacks that since it was not a conventional war, unlawful enemy combatants captured in the fight against al-Qaeda would not be considered prisoners of war and thus would not be afforded the protections of the convention. The new manual called Human Intelligence Collector Operations applies to all the armed services, not just the Army. It does not cover the Central Intelligence Agency, which also has come under investigation for mistreatment of prisoners in Iraq and Afghanistan and for allegedly keeping suspects in secret prisons elsewhere around the world since the September 11 attacks. Sixteen of the manual's 19 interrogation techniques were covered in the old manual and three new ones were added on the basis of lessons learned from the counter-terror war, Kimmon said. The additions are that the interrogators may use the good cop, bad cop tact with prisoners, they may portray themselves as someone other than an American interrogator, and they may use separation, basically keeping prisoners apart from each other so enemy combatants can't coordinate their answers with each other. The last will be used only on unlawful combatants, not POWs, only as an exception and only with permission of a high-level commander, Kimmon said. The Pentagon also on Wednesday released a new policy directive on detention operations that says the handling of prisoners must, at a minimum, abide by the standards of the Geneva Conventions and lays out the responsibilities of senior, civilian, and military officials who oversee detention operations. The revisions took time, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Detainee Affairs, Kali Stimson, said at the briefing. It took time because it was important to get it right, and we did get it right. You know, it's interesting that it, the Department of Defense took the time and the effort to rewrite their manuals as a result of the abuses that came about following Mr. Bradbury's legal justification for use of torture. Here's what the Army Field Manual 2-22.3 says. This is the Human Intelligence Collector Operations Manual dated September 6, 2006. This is what the Army now teaches our soldiers. All captured or detained personnel, regardless of status, shall be treated humanely and in accordance with the Detainee Treatment Act of 2005 and DOD Directive 2310.1 ECHO, Department of Defense Detainee Program. And no person in the custody or under the control of DOD, regardless of nationality, or physical location shall be subject to torture or cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment in accordance with and as defined in U.S. law. All intelligence interrogations, debriefings, and tactical questionings to gain intelligence from captured or detained personnel shall be conducted in accordance with applicable law and policy. Applicable law and policy include U.S. law, the law of war, relevant international law, relevant directives, including DOD Directive 3115.09, DOD Intelligence Interrogations, Detainee Debriefings and Tactical Questioning, DOD Directive 2310.1E, the Department of Defense Detainee Program, DOD Instructions and Military Execute Orders, including FRAGOs. Use of torture is not only illegal, but also it is a poor technique that yields unreliable results, may damage subsequent collection efforts, and can induce the source to say what he thinks the human collector wants to hear. Use of torture can also have many possible negative consequences at national and international levels. All prisoners and detainees, regardless of status, will be treated humanely. Cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, and degrading treatment is prohibited. The Detainee Treatment Act of 2005 defines cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment as the cruel, unusual, and inhuman treatment or punishment provided by the 5th, 8th, or 14th Amendments to the United States Constitution. This definition refers to an extensive body of law developed by the courts of the United States to determine when, under various circumstances, treatment of individuals would be inconsistent with American constitutional standards related to concepts of dignity, civilization, humanity, decency, and fundamental fairness. All DOD procedures for treatment of prisoners, detainees, 
and detainees have been reviewed and are consistent with these standards as well as our obligation under international law as interpreted by the United States. Questions about applications not, re applications not resolved in the field by reference to DOD publications must be forwarded to higher headquarters for legal review and specific approval by the appropriate authority. Isn't it amazing that it took the Army to contradict and to come up with the procedures to counter the very actions that Mr. Bradbury was willing to condone, and we want this man back in government? He doesn't belong back in government. This is a man who has as his first priority not America's values, not the morality of this nation, not humanity. His first value is, what is it that my boss wants me to say and I'll find a way to do it? And he said just as much in testimony. That is not who we want as a top lawyer over in the Department of Transportation. Simply not acceptable. In that same Army Field Manual, there's a section that talks about how interrogation um, should be conducted and the prohibited actions included, which are not limited to forcing the detainee to be naked, to perform a sexual acts, or pose in a sexual manner, placing hoods or sacks over the head of a detainee, using duct tape over the eyes, applying beatings, electric shock, burns, or other forms of physical pain, waterboarding, using military working dogs, inducing hypothermia or heat injury, conducting mock executions, depriving the detainee of necessary food, water, or medical care. The field manual goes on to say, while using legitimate interrogation techniques, certain applications of, of approaches and techniques may approach the line between permissible actions and prohibited items. It may often be difficult to determine where permissible actions end and prohibited actions begin. In attempting to determine if a contem contemplated approach or technique should be considered prohibited and therefore should not be included in an interrogation plan, consider these two tests before submitting the plan for approval. One, if the proposed approach technique were used by the enemy against one of your fellow soldiers, would you believe the soldier had been abused? Two, could, you conduct, could your conduct in carrying out the proposed technique violate a law or regulation? Keep in mind that even if you personally would not consider your actions to constitute abuse, the law may be more restrictive. Boy, I wish that those questions had been made available to Mr. Bradbury when he was writing up his memo. Because the actions he condoned in his memo certainly would have failed this very simple two-question test. The manual says if you answered yes to either of these questions, questions, the contemplated action should not be conducted. If the human collector has any doubt that an interrogation approach containing an approved interrogation plan is consistent with applicable law, or if he believes that he is being told to use an illegal technique, the human collector should seek immediate guidance from the chain of command and consult with the SJA to obtain legal review of the pr proposed approach or technique. If the human collector believes that an interrogation approach or technique is unlawful during the interrogation of a detainee, the human collector must stop the interrogation immediately and contact the chain of command for additional guidance. This is not something that Stephen Bradbury did or even now has stated that he wished he had done because his memo, which allowed all the torture techniques that I've already detailed, would truly have failed these two tests. And he would have failed in moving forward with his memo to do the basic thing, which is to stop an illegal activity from occurring. At this point, the Army Field Manual provides some cautions to include, and I quote, although no single comprehensive source defines impermissible coercion, certain acts are clearly prohibited. Certain prohibited physical coercion may be obvious, such as physically abusing the subject of the screening interrogations. Other forms of impermissible coercion may be more subtle and may include threats to turn the individual over to others to be abused, 
subjecting the individual to impermissible, humiliating, or degrading treatment, implying harm to the individual or his property. Other prohibited actions include implying a de deprivation of applicable protections guaranteed by law because of a failure to cooperate, threatening to separate parents from their children, or forcing a protected person to guide US forces in a dangerous area. Where there is doubt, the memo says, you should consult your supervisor or servicing judge advocate. This is the problem. Mr. Bradbury, in writing this memo, showed absolutely no attempts or even desire to figure out whether what he was trying to justify was truly legal in keeping with American values was the right thing to do for the United States. He simply moved forward with writing and drafting this memo because the President of the United States wanted it to happen. That is not the democracy that we live in. We don't live in a dictatorship. We are the greatest democracy on the face of the earth because we are individuals who have the right to exercise a moral authority and to speak up. Mr. Bradbury showed none of that. And even in testimony, has expressed no regrets, no regrets in the legal wranglings that he went through in order to justify torture. No, he showed no introspection, no thought as to whether or not it was the right thing to do. As far as he was concerned, his superiors wanted him to do this, so he did it. So what is he gonna do at the Department of Transportation? What is he gonna do when somebody there tells him that, well, you know, the airbag manufacturers have decided that it's just too expensive, and so we need you to come up with justification uh, to, for us to stop using airbags. What is he going to do when people come to him and say, you know, we really want to increase alcohol sales, so I think we should get rid of drunk driving laws. What is he going to do? He has shown that he's willing to do whatever his superiors have asked him to do and that he is just the right guy for the job if you want a lawyer who is going to execute legal gymnastics to find a way to make something happen. Do we really want that person at the very top of the legal department at the Department of Transportation? Not to mention the fact that once he is Senate confirmed and in the Department of Transportation, it is that much easier to move him to another Senate confirmed position and there's no, just, no guarantee that he won't make his way back over to the Department of Justice to create more harm. I ask my colleagues, if you care about this country, if you care about our troops who are in harm's way right now, please understand what it means to our troops who are downrange right now in all the corners of the globe, facing the enemy, facing potentially being captured in their execution of their duties, protecting and defending our constitution of these great United States, to know, to know that the enemy believes that America tortures, and to know that they are at that much greater risk of being, if they were to be captured, to be tortured themselves. Mr. President, I can't oppose Mr. Bradbury's nominations strongly enough. His most prominent and consequential work was to justify unlawful torture and detainee abuse. His comments in testimony during his confirmation hearings did not alleviate any of my concerns. I know many of my colleagues are considering voting yes on this man because they think, well, he's gonna be over in the Department of Transportation. That was years ago. Um, he won't have to write legal justification for the use of torture again. And, and we've passed laws about it since then. But he has shown that despite existing laws previously, he was able to find a way to get around them to justify torture. So how do we know that he won't do the same thing again at the Department of Transportation when it comes to the public safety? What about our kids who ride school buses to school? They deserve protections. The American public deserves protections. What they don't deserve is a man who has no moral compass when it comes to what is right and what is wrong, but only a compass that points to what is it that my bosses want me to do.
That's not what the American people need. That is certainly not something we should be voting for. And if in your conversations with, the, with Mr. Bradbury, he promised you that, uh, uh, he promised you that, that he would be independent. I just ask you to look at his record. He's never been independent. And in fact, when asked if he would recuse himself from various cases, uh, he in committee um, actually uh, avoided answering those questions, did not answer them straightforwardly, and showed that he's simply not willing to commit to doing what is right. And I don't know how anybody can, can vote for him. I don't know what he has said in private conversations, what he says he thinks he will do at the Department of Transportation. All I can ask is for my colleagues to please look at the evidence, and the evidence is overwhelming. This is a man who cannot be trusted with the values of this country. He cannot be trusted to do what is right on behalf of the American people. He is not someone who will speak truth to power. And if anything, this is a time in this country that we need more people who will speak truth to power, not someone who will kowtow to power. And that's exactly the kind of person Mr. Bradbury is. He is an unprincipled lawyer who is paired with an unprincipled, who will be paired with an unprincipled executive, and that is a dangerous combination regardless of what agency he serves. Again, I ask my colleagues to please vote no on Mr. Bradbury. I cannot oppose his nomination strongly enough. And if you have any questions, please come talk to those of us who have worn the uniform of this great nation, who know what it's like to be in jeopardy of being captured by the enemy, who know what it's like to hope and pray that the nations around the world who view America's conduct as the bellwether for how we treat others know that they themselves will be treated in the same manner that we treat our prisoners. And those troops are in harm's way right now know that because of Mr. Bradbury, they are less safe, they are less able to do their jobs. And when our troops go into harm's way, they should only focus on getting the job done, not on what will happen should they become captured. And thanks to Mr. Bradbury, that is a real threat for them now. Uh, I ask my colleagues again to please say no. Mr. President, I thank you for this time. I note the absence of a quorum.